Hello, everyone, and welcome to the book one finale for The Legend of Korra, Avatar, the podcast. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. We have such an exciting episode to go through, and we talked earlier. I felt like this is going to be a quick episode, but there's a couple of theories that I want to talk about, a couple of little things that I want to touch upon, because they, they really wrapped this up very quickly. They did. I will say that before we get into anything, the episode felt so fast. Yes. And there was so much that went on. Yes. Um, so I cannot wait to hear your theories. Yeah. And we know it's because at the time they only got renewed for one season. So they were, you know, they wanted to make it a nice clean present for everyone. Yeah, um, tight with a bow at the end. Yeah, ends. exactly. But like maybe a little yep. too tight. We'll talk about it. Before we do, <laughs> we have a couple, and by couple I mean now three for today. Five star written reviews from Apple Podcast. Yes. And our first one comes from, I love this name, Cabbage Man's Lawyer. I love it. <laughs> so good. Cabbage Man's Lawyer writes, I was too lazy to write a review until I saw a joke slash pun that made me immediately think of y'all. Here's the pun. Uh oh. If Zuko worries about where the avatar is, does he have anxiety? I am so mad. That I did not think about this. That is so it's up your alley. Ten out of pun. ten. Like it's 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 amazing. That's it's what amazing. it is. It's it's, it's <laughs> the best. I love it. It's so good. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. That it's is gonna not haunt all. me. Yeah, okay. All right. He's gonna haunt you. He's gonna haunt me. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> the pun that never was. Yeah. The pun that <laughs> the pun that got away. Oh no. Uh Cabbage Man's lawyer continues to write saying, Anyway, I really love this podcast and it's the only one I can consistently listen to without getting bored. After finishing the original series and reading the comics, I still wasn't ready to jump into Korra, but I can't wait to watch it alongside y'all. I know this is long, but I want to apologize because I love talking about Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, but my family is sick of all the fun facts plus anything Avatar related and has the smiling tear face. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it to us, Cabbage Man's lawyer. We're here uh -huh. for it. That's what we're here for. My top five are Appa in the number one spot. Love him so much, but episode Nightmares and Daydreams made me laugh so much. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Plus, he carries the group quite literally. Number two, Sokka, after he sorts his sexism out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Number three, Iroh and Zuko. I put these together because I love them most in their moments together. Fair. Fair, fair, fair. Number four, Toph. And number five, Katara. Would you rather be in prison with Azula, Suki, or Iroh? Iroh. Ooh. Not Probably Azula. Iro. Well, not Azula. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. Not, just not Azula. And which one would you most likely want to escape with? Azula. I'd say Suki. Really? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. You know what? Maybe not Azula, too. Yeah, because she will just burn me alive. And I'm a moment's notice. <laughs> burn you and leave you on the side of the road. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. Well, but you know yeah. what, though? What? Between the three of them, only one really had a solo successful prison escape. Yeah. True. So. True. Maybe Iroh again? I mean. Suki didn't break herself out of prison, but she was broken out of prison. She was in there for a while. Well, I mean, I guess so was Iroh was in there for longer. Yeah. Fair, yeah. fair. On either of these scenarios, if I just like showed up and Suki or Iroh was there, great. Mm -hmm. If we're breaking mm -hmm. out and Suki or Iroh was there, great. If yeah. Azula's there, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm, sh I'm already dead. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. 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 Agreed. I'd say Suki or Iroh interchangeably. In mm -hmm. either of the situations. Mm -hmm. And that is it. Thank you, Cabbage Man's Lawyer, for Thank that you. review. Our next five star written review comes from Apollo, who put in just a boatload of emojis. Heart fire, heart fire, heart fire, heart fire, heart fire, heart fire, heart eyes, like a whole bunch of them. It'll be on the screen and you can all see it anyways. Just all these wonderful emojis. Just super excited to be leaving a five star written review. All the emotions, all the happy emotions. I know. I, I feel like I need, like, a codex to, like, decrypt <laughs> this. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. It's uh, like, it's like uh, binary, but in yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so since that one, and super appreciative, Apollo. Thank you. So, And by the way, there's, like, 47 exclamation marks after Apollo's yeah. name. Um yeah. We're, I'll go ahead and just read the third one, which comes from Seabass Bass, or could be Seabass Bass. Seabass Bass. Bass. <laughs> sea bass. But like one. the base is like a sea bass base, like a you know like a base yeah. in trouble. That's how yeah. I read it. But Seabass Bass, bass I is funnier. I think that makes sense. 
we don't know what it is. We're so we're Either just gonna... one. <laughs> double. There's areas both, of double oh seven. Have... Yeah. <laughs> the end of their screen name. Uh, yep. They write the best Avatar podcast ever with four exclamation marks. I listen to your podcast every night. I came over from Spotify so I could leave a review. I specifically put four exclamation points because in one of your earlier episodes, Greg said that four exclamation points was the perfect amount. And you know what? I love that. I don't remember saying that, but I stand by it. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Someone's paying attention to me and it's not me. <laughs> Thank you for the callback. Thank 007. You. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for leaving these five star written reviews. Uh, Acorn and I super appreciate them. We have so much more to go through and it just, every time I see a new one, it warms my heart. So uh, you literally said the phrase I was going to say, yeah. I was just, I was sitting here like feeling warm in my feelings yeah. going like these reviews just always make me feel so warm and cozy and nice. So thank you everyone for taking the time, especially those of you who listen on Spotify and then come over to leave a review. Thank mm -hmm. you for taking that extra effort to let us know that you've been listening and that you appreciate uh, the podcast. It really means yeah. a lot. Yeah. And some of these people are tracking down rogue Apple devices just to yes. leave the five star <laughs> review. Yep. Uh, so thank you all so, so much. Appreciate it. Again, if you want to hear your review read live on the, not live, pre recorded live on the show, uh, just live. Go, live. <laughs> it's, I mean, whatever. Um, Air quotes. <laughs> find an Apple device, leave a five star written review because you need to write it. It's just how this works. This whole thing. This whole language thing. This whole it's language just thing. Kind of, yeah, it's part of the process. Works. Yeah. We don't really say this super often, but it does also help the podcast out quite a bit. It helps with discoverability. It helps with uh, other people who are kind of like, well, which one do I want to listen to? You know, the official Nickelodeon one or this one. This one is beautiful illustrated art that was custom made per season. What, what do we what do we do here and these reviews super help out so thank you all so much we appreciate it this is book one episode 12 end game or as we like to call it a monster exposed Ooh, it's true speaking of puns yes uh this episode was written by michael dante di martino and brian Canetsko and was directed by joaquin de santos and ki hyun ryu perhaps for the last time yes because... i think this is where things are going to be shaken up uh for better or for worse is that me being nervous about book two maybe this episode begins with asami bolin and iro rushing to aman's secret airfield riding on naga iro lays out the plan and the three rush off to the airfield instructing naga and pabu to stay behind while they approach the airfield they notice that it's actually fairly unguarded and that there are these just fence posts without any fencing Asami comments on this and finds out that there is, in fact, a fence in between the fence posts. It's an electric fence. And unfortunately, they all find it out the hard way and are rendered unconscious from the shock. Can you imagine if electric fences like were like that in our world instead of the like um the like woven fabric like yeah. things that you use for electric fences? Like uh -huh. oof. I feel like this was a big Sokka move for some reason. It's like, oh, weird. No fit. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <Whoa>. Yeah. <laughs> Back in Republic City, Amon addresses a cheering crowd at the pro bending arena about the beginning of his quest to rid the world of bending. Mako and Korra reveal themselves to be disguised as equal as foot soldiers and tell everyone that he is lying and is, in fact, a bloodbender named Noah Talk. Amon, I love this bit. He does the Batman squint as soon as like it super zooms in. He's like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. As the crowd begins to get all riled up and Amon tells them that they have nothing to fear from the Avatar and that they should hear out what she has to say. So he's kind of being like, no, no, I'm the better one here. I'm the adult. I'm taking the higher road. The mm -hmm. lieutenant becomes suspicious of Amon as Korra continues to reveal Amon's true lineage and that he is in fact the son of Yakon and brother of Councilman Tarlock. Amon chuckles, calling Korra's story an amusing tale, and then takes off his mask, showing a horribly scarred face from a burn, which lines up with his backstory that he gave himself. Korra and Mako are stunned as the crowd turns on the two. As they try to leave, a platform rises from under the stage, revealing Tenzin and his family bound and gagged. Okay, I gotta stop you here. Uh -huh, two things. Yeah. I could not remember this finale, 
I've said before on the podcast that I watched uh, the first two books of Korra when it was airing. It has been years. I do not remember very much at all. And so when he removed his his mask, I was like, ooh, I forgot we got to see his face, but I don't remember what his face looks like. And then he shows the scars, and I'm like, oh, wait, he wasn't lying? Wait. <laughs> What? What firebender got his face? Yeah. And then we're going to find out later like that things are not quite as they seem. But it was just really cool to see this uh, this interaction. And of course, I called it the last episode when Cora is like, all we have to do is go and uh, expose him in front of his followers. It'll be easy. And mm-hmm. then we get there and Amon's like, it's literally he said, she said. And the followers are like, look, his face is burned and scarred. Like, of course, he's telling the truth. And it's like, ah. I told you that Cora. Yeah. Yeah. I found it interesting because I was editing last week's or, or the last episode while I was like watching and writing this one up. And I found it interesting that you had um a theory and I had a theory because we both couldn't remember like exactly what would happen. I remembered the very end of this episode, not the very mm. the the first ending, let's call it, with yeah. um Noah talk on the boat. I remember that very vividly. Uh, but I couldn't remember this bit either. And I, my theory was he was just going to manipulate or is that your theory he was just going to manipulate the crowd and be like well yeah but i'm so great anyways and it was your theory and you should trust me because who better to take down bending than a bender and then i'll just take away my own bending it's fine and then i was worried about i don't remember some other thing like we neither of us were super prepared for this which is just right theatrics exactly like i got the i got the he said she said part and how a mom was just going to smooth it over yeah the explanation is not the part that I got right because he didn't even talk about bending. We find out later or they find out later that he truly is a bender. I don't know. It's like (laughs) maybe the lesson here is like sometimes it's not enough just to wield truth because it's so easy to twist and manipulate the perception of truth, especially when you're going against someone like Amon. Um, The second thing is watching Tenzin and his family get pulled out of the stage yeah gave me like a sick feeling because i I was like oh no the last remaining airbenders are all lined up like a like a bending stealing buffet in front of amon and we haven't been able to stop him up until this point what is going to happen i had like true anxiety (laughs) yeah it's it's like what a what a monster a monster that was if if you missed it from the or as we like to call it that gets this this (laughs) peaceful family yeah and just puts a spectacle on for all of his followers in taking away the last of the airbenders forever potentially he even uses that line too yeah insane well yes amon plans to rid the world of airbending right once and for all at this main event and cora is confused because she definitely saw them get away from air temple island and repeats this fact several times like she's in shock she can't process what's going on right now yeah and Fei Fong went with them. Yeah. So that's like even more of an issue. Like they were followed and they were over. I mean, okay. Yeah, the kids are not professional like master airbenders, but they're they're pretty good. We've seen them fight on Air Temple Island. Between the three of them and Tenzin and then even Bei Fong's like, I don't know, hand-to-hand combat or whatever because we know that she has her bending taken away. Mm-hmm. All of that... And they mm-hmm. were still overtaken and taken captive and brought back. Like, oh, my goodness. Also, this I found very, very funny. The fact that we are back at the pro bending arena. They made a point in the commentary to be like, we spent so much time and money <laughs> uh-huh. designing this place. We were very happy to be able to use it again in yeah. this show. That made me laugh. <laughs> it's it's good, though, because the size and the scale uh, makes it feel very, like, overwhelming, especially with, like, Amon's little uh display here mm-hmm. it's a really good place for all of us to, to uh to go down this is probably one of the few modernization parts that i enjoyed uh was the fact that they set it up like a concert because that's what happens at actual stadiums that aren't being used for sporting events yeah. set up like a concert i thought that was really neat uh, i appreciated yeah. that yeah they made a note thematically too how it makes sense that it's a bending arena mm-hmm. taking over for a anti-bending event we're going to take a moment and go back to to the airfield where hiroshi does like this big bad evil guy speech to his own daughter hiroshi gives the order to destroy bumi's fleet and reveals that he intercepted the message sent for reinforcements and knows exactly where they are hiding when hiroshi leaves iroh learns that while bolin 
doesn't know metal bending, Naga can bend metal with her polar bare hands. Yep. Naga's just popping off the last couple episodes. Oh, yes. She's been an all-star. I feel like her existence just really helped wrap things up that needed to get wrapped up in an action sort of way. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. It also does remind me of when Appa was really like holding his own against yeah yeah that well i don't remember what episode that was it was back in the book chase? one maybe it was the chase because it, it when, was ang uh, versus zuko and then appa was also helping out yeah also when um tylee may and um and azula were going after them and appa was shedding there was a couple times oh where yeah, he yeah. Did, like his big air bison tail attack that's right yeah he had a couple good he's shiny great moments he is great i love i love appa i miss him so much to Oogie is just not the same no and we'll talk about why on our coverage of book two because i already have thoughts and i can't wait to talk about them who needs a metal bender when you have a naga the group splits up and jumps into action asami jumps into a mecha tank and notes how similar the controls are to a forklift which i think is a callback to the comics i think so too yeah yeah future industries forklift Uh uh-huh and i just I really appreciate her character being so hands-on and like adaptable and stuff. It's nice to see like the ingenuity that you see in bending Mm -hmm. and using bending in certain clever ways to accomplish tasks in someone who is a non-bender. Like she just has a whole bunch of knowledge and is able to adapt into the situation that she's in. And so I just, I just appreciate that about her character. I was thinking that this episode. Yeah. Asami jumps into her mecha tank and, Instantly is great at it. And Iroh flies up to one of the airplanes and throws the foot soldier out, allowing him to fly towards the rest of the fleet. And I appreciate that the opposite is true for Iroh. How he gets in the plane and it's just like, it's like super wobbly (laughs) of a flight. Back at the stadium, Korra and Mako try to save the last airbenders from Amon. While Mako distracts Amon, Korra is able to free the airbenders and tells them to get to safety. Amon is not too far behind and gives chase to Korra and Mako through the hallways of the stadium. That's where they were like, where's Lynn? Lynn got caught. Okay, cool. Bye. Thank you for rescue. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Once they are alone in the equipment room, Amon reveals that they were right about his identity by blood bending both Mako and Korra. Amon grabs Korra by the back of the neck and presses his thumb to her forehead, removing her bending forever. I told you I would destroy you, he tells the Avatar. Oh, this whole sequence was such a horror movie fuel. I know. It was so well done. Uh Uh-huh. And that was intentional, too. They talked about it in the commentary about how they wanted to show how frightening Amon was. And I didn't realize until after he bloodbended her, because I flashed back when he was a kid and he was being trained how to bloodbend. I'm sure he could, like, sense her heart and the rushing of her blood the way that a waterbender would be able to sense water. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, I find that thought too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's even creepier the fact that he just casually walked by pretending he didn't see her. And then when maybe her blood pressure went down a little bit, she <laughs> like, breathed a sigh of relief. He's like, oh, got you. And then pulled her out. Like it was so well done. And it really the feeling of how powerful Amon is, um, is again consistent in this episode because there were times where I'm like, how are they going to get out of this? Like, yeah. He has two very capable benders in his blood bending grip and there's no one else to come save them. I also had this thought of how this scene kind of shows maybe um, the other side of being the avatar in terms of maybe learning the other bendings at too early of an age. Because Korra could water, fire, and earth bend from when she was, what, six years old, seven years old, like super young. Yeah. Um, so maybe something like she hid and this is from a very storytelling standpoint to show how scary Amon is, but she never considered that like he could just sense her from the water in her own body, from the blood in her own body. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was no use really hiding anyways. And like, maybe if she had had more time with water bending before the other elements, like maybe Roku had, because we didn't see Roku until he was a teenager, but they didn't show him bending the other elements that was kind of like in the the fire lord and the avatar he went on his journey he got his masters and all of that very traditionally kind of like ang did but Korra has been untraditional so far yeah 
learning in one spot and having like masters come to her to teach her. But yeah. also the fact that like bloodbending is is uh is banned. It's un it's illegal. But so it's not just the blood though, because like our bodies are made up of water too. So one would even be able to surmise that like you could as a water bender just sense a water source. Yeah. Even if you're like not sure what it is. Is my that's more like right kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Like the training, the traditional training of sensing water in the environment and around you it's so different than seeing like a body as a water source that's fair or as like you know blood i'm sure like the awareness is probably different because you're yeah. aware of like the landscape around you versus like the human in front of you it's just like almost having blinders on i guess yeah but like the fact that blood bending is illegal means you probably like as a bender you probably have a very basic understanding of it without understanding like the risks that would be involved going up against a bloodbender. She probably has not been told about it as as much as the next person. Mm -hmm. It's not talked about. It's illegal. Don't worry about trying to train the avatar in defense. No one will do it. No one can do it. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. So it's almost like a missed opportunity. Yeah. Well, not anymore. I would assume mm -hmm. after <laughs> this season. In the skies above Republic City, however, Iroh is able to easily... I, I use that term loosely here. Take down the fleet of airplanes in a dazzling spectacle of firebending and is able to remove Amon's mask from the giant statue of Aang. He smiles and thanks Aang for looking out for him. I thought that was a really nice little scene. Yeah. If if I could change one thing in this episode, that's not the entire ending that just gets wrapped up super quick. It would be that there's a stray gust of wind that helps Iroh out. Oh, that would be really nice. I was like, they have to. I watched that scene four times and it yeah. didn't happen. And he's just like, you know, thank it's like thanking uh, your ancestors or, you know, mm -hmm. for the help. But I would really like if there was just a stray something from the spirit world that helped him. That would have been really cute and nice. <sighs> that would have been so nice. Yeah. Oh, well. At the airship field, Naga takes down more mecha tanks with ease, saving Bolin from a lethal encounter. Again, Naga to the rescue. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Asami faces her father, telling him that he's too filled with hatred to feel love. Enraged, Hiroshi attacks Asami and nearly delivers a killing blow when Bolin and Naga rush in, distracting the terrible father just long enough for Asami to get the upper hand. She rips open the chassis of her father's mecha tank, but pauses for a moment, fighting back her own anger. Hiroshi takes advantage of this pause and launches an attack that misses and tries to run away. You really are a horrible father, Asami says as she launches a spinning wire trap that entangles and electrifies Hiroshi into submission. She bows her head and sheds a tear. Ah, uh, this sequence was so fast, but it was yeah. also so powerful because yeah. we've seen the the crumbling and dismantling of their relationship being like father and daughter. And this, I think, was really the moment where it completely broke for Asami and she recognizes that my father's not who I thought he was, but to um, an irredeemable point where oh, she's just like, sure. this is it. Like I'm accepting in this moment, like my relationship with my family and my father is over and this is me moving on. Yeah. Like come, <laughs> walking out of the fire, I guess, of the coals of my relationship with my father that has burnt down. It was just really emotionally powerful. What's interesting though, Brian was one of the people, one of the voices on the commentary that watching the episode kept like noting different parts where he wished he could have used more time mm -hmm. or could get like a like a director's cut redo kind of thing um because he was watching that particular scene with the the warehouse and just going like man I really wish like we could have done this differently or I what I wanted it to be more like this and I feel like I could I didn't do enough with the setting and this and that but then he did like a moment of self-reflection where he said, well, but then at the same time, like when I talked to industry friends and fans who watched this episode and they're like, oh my God, I cried. Like this was so emotionally impactful. It was a great scene. He realized, well, I don't have to get all of the, the setting perfect. I don't have to get it right, right every single time. As long as it conveys the emotional points of the story and conveys the story itself, then that's what matters in the end. Yeah, And I thought sure. as a creative, that was a really interesting observation because it's so easy to be critical of yourself and see the opportunities and mistakes um, in the thing that you've created. Meanwhile, other people watching it are just like, wow, this is great. Like, 
this is so good. Not even noticing all of those things that um, the creator would probably. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to do too. And um, I think every creative ever in the history of creating does that. Um, but in, if I just want to pause right there and say, if you're out there and you're feeling the same way about any work that you're doing, stop, finish the work, publish it, release it, whatever was the final step for your creation process or put it away, whatever it is, come back to it three months later. You probably won't see it as much anymore. Yeah. That's another thing. When you get really deep into a process and it's all you're seeing, you can't, you, you're seeing the trees, not the forest anymore. Yeah. Getting that time in, in space will really help too. For sure. Yeah. This is the part for me anyways, in the episode where Hiroshi just became unredeemable for yeah. me. Like, like I was, everyone knows me and I enjoy the villains and I like, except for like Ozai and Sozin and most of the royal <laughs> bloodline that's not on like the good side, right? But I like, I like how in depth they are and I like how three-dimensionally end up being and her, that is still true for Hiroshi but this is just not something that like sits well with me mm. like there are several times where Asami pauses and lets her father like try to like calm down and you know like do the right thing and he just doesn't get it and he doesn't do it now maybe this will change if we see him again in future seasons I don't know but like he was just terrible, horrible. He's fighting his own daughter in a mech suit, like trying to kill trying her. Trying to kill her, yeah. Lethal blows, yeah. He would have if it wasn't for Bolin and his little dog too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was just horrible. And I, I, every time I watch this episode and I see that bit, I just uh, I want to fast forward it so bad. And it, fortunately, it's not super long, but it's just. It really, I think, shows you how deep in the woods Hiroshi is in these beliefs and, and yeah. how radicalized he had become from Amon's words. Yep. Insane. And I, I think it's also hitting close to home because of the times that we live in as well. It's just I could very easily see this happening to have families in this day and age. Oh, totally. Yeah. And it has. Yeah. There are certain organizations mm -hmm. and belief systems and even politics that suck people in and change their worldview to a point where they don't see what's in front of them anymore. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a shame uh, mm -hmm. to put it very lightly. Yes. Anyways, let's go back to our favorite cult leader, Amon, <laughs> who is gloating over Korra. And Korra barely manages to escape, gets on her feet, and throws a single punch that looks like it's supposed to be like a fire blast of some kind. Yeah. And nothing comes out. And she falls to the ground. That's when the lieutenant walks in, having seen Amon's bloodbending, and he feels betrayed. After all, he devoted his life to this cause and gave everything he had. He removes his mask and crushes it under his foot and tries to attack Amon directly. Amon blood bends his former lieutenant and throws him into a pile of planks, knocking him out. Uh, do you think Amon killed him? I don't think it, yes, but I don't think he did it purposefully. I don't think he cared enough to do it purposefully. I think he just carelessly, like, whatever, you're, you're of no use to me anymore. Get out of here. That's how I yeah. kind of read that. There was something about the way that Amon held him up in the air and just, like, showed that he really did not care yeah that made me think he was like one second away from like thanos snapping <laughs> or like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know like he was one step away from just going yeah and like killing him but instead it being a kid's show he tosses him into like the the pile of like wood and whatever i couldn't tell if that was insinuating that the lieutenant died and it was that easy for amon to throw his right hand man yeah Oh, completely away yeah i think i'd be okay with either or like I, it's a real schrodinger's lieutenant that we got going on right now but <laughs> the schrodinger's lieutenant in the pile of wood <laughs> yeah is he a dead is he alive i mean i don't know like i really liked this whole scene i really enjoyed mm -hmm. it and i don't think whether he killed him or not 
changes anything for me, to be honest with you. Like it, either way, it's very weird to think about a man's life, whether it was taken or not, and whether if it was taken, if it was on purpose or not, it, it, you know, like that's on the balance and it just doesn't matter. I don't think it's the only time I think I'll ever say an avatar, the last airbender other than the great divide where it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and even the great divide, I would argue does matter because we got to see that point, point where Aang just blatantly lies. Um, but uh -huh. like, yeah, he was just so like, all right, you're of no use to me, whether you live or die, it doesn't matter. Go away. Right. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you because yeah, I don't no, really I think, know. I think it's a good point though, because the fact that he threw him away and severed their connection as like working together, I think that is, that is the, the point. It doesn't matter what happens to, to the Lieutenant after that. It's still the betrayal. And what a betrayal. For a character that we don't have a name for, what an insane betrayal and character moment. I know. I felt it. Yeah. I was like, I was emotionally impacted by that because of the look of just like despair and disillusionment on the lieutenant's face. Oh, man. And the way mm -hmm. he like pulls off his mask with his head hanging and just lets it drop and then steps on it. It's like righteous anger, but also like despair and yeah. grief for like the the truth that he just learned that shattered his worldview it was also another thanos-esque moment and yes everyone i know that this came before avengers endgame but scarlet witch is just like you ruined everything everything from me and he's like i don't even know who you are i actually now that i'm thinking about it i'm making those connections i yeah. like that we don't know the lieutenant's name and i never want to know his name because aman doesn't even know his name properly and he doesn't care to know his name it's so yeah. yakone like it he's just so channeling his father right now. Yep. Brutal. It's so brutal. Uh huh. We get the Schrodinger's lieutenant going on. Mm -hmm. Amon turns to Mako and approaches him to remove his fire bending, but is shocked to learn that Mako can still lightning bend. And he does so, shooting the equalist leader across the room. Mako then unleashes a torrent of fire blasts, grabs Korra, and tries to run away. Yeah, I was a little on the fence about this moment because okay. it felt too convenient uh, for him to be able to I disagree. lightning bend. I disagree. If this is one of your theories, it's I would love theories. to hear it. I've I've gotten to a point where I'm more comfortable with it because I had to think it through. Yeah. Um, but just in the you know bam 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 sequence of the of the show, I was like, wait, uh, what? That was yeah. really simple. So let me hear. Let me hear your thoughts. It reminded me of Zuko in, I think it was Boiling Rock Part 2, when he was mm. stuck in the ice cage, which was supposed yeah. to not let him firebend, and he still could. It was very reminiscent of that for me, where he shouldn't have been able to generate lightning, but he was still able to because, and I they talk about this in the commentary a little bit as well, bending is as much about breathing as it is the actual movements that you make which mm -hmm. is how kind of psychic blood bending works. If you think about it, we're seeing a more streamlined fire bending. Like if you look at all the fire torrents that um, Mako is able to output, he's not like doing all the movements that he needs to, to generate the, the chi to do it, right? He's just like, pow, 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 pow. It's like almost superhero power at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just because he's has that control of his breathing that he's able to, and he he's... Granted, running on instinct, it's not like he's Iro and he's doing all this like stuff purposefully. It's very much by accident. But mm -hmm. I think he learned an important lesson in that moment. And that's just breathing is as important as the actual art of bending itself. And that's how he's able to get it out, I think. That's my that's my theory. That's basically where I landed on. Yeah. It was about the breath. And I did have that moment thinking about um Zuko in the Boiling Rock prison. You're right. Because it had that same like He's huddled and like he has a very intentional breath that leads to lightning. Um, my only critique about this episode is that it was so fast. It was yeah. breakneck speed and oh, the yeah. pacing felt off because of that. But the content itself, I like when you sit for a second and think about it because Amon had a lot going on there. And while he is like an incredible master bloodbender who's able to bloodbend, psychic bloodbend, no less. Yeah. multiple people at one time if his attention drifts even just a little bit that would give someone like mako the chance to take the breath needed to lightning bend and get out of that hold um yes. 
He also yeah. underestimated Mako 100% because he's like, oh, I just yeah. took down the Avatar. Like, who are you? You're a jock. You are a <laughs> professional athlete. Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah, exactly. It's just the parallels that, purposeful or not, are being pulled from the main series into this one. Uh, mm -hmm. Insane. This should have been two episodes, and I'm convinced that it was supposed to be, and it just wasn't. Because every single finale that we've seen so far in the main series was a two-parter. I know. I think that that's what we're suffering from at this breakneck speed is there's going to be a bit more pacing, some more stuff. It was probably only like maybe 20 minutes, which is almost a full episode. And they talked about how like going into this project, they were greenlit for the one season and they were writing from the beginning this number of episodes. I do think it was the 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 length of the series or of the book, rather. I think the only, it's part of the number of episodes, but I also think they may have, and this is just me going out on a limb, uh, wondering this, they may have underestimated the amount of time it would it needed to tell this part of the story, the finale. And so they maybe like blocked it out and went like, okay, these things happen in the finale. But when they actually got there, it was like, and maybe even when it got to the animation studio, then it turned into like, ooh, we are moving kind of fast, but we don't have any choice now. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it, me kind of wonder if that was part of the process. I would imagine so. Yeah. I would agree with that. Uh, okay. So this is the fun part. This is the other, this is like back to back theories for me in this next bit. I'm so excited. Okay. Yes. Uh, so Mako and Korra are running away. Amon is able to catch up super easily to the two and uses bloodbending on Mako to incapacitate him. While he is impressed that Mako is able to get the best of Amon, he must equalize the pro bender either way, which is almost. Ashamed to do, as he says. Just as Amon is about to equalize Mako, Korra comes to her senses and unleashes a gust of air bending at Amon. Korra somehow has unlocked her air bending. And mm -hmm. this is super cool. And a lot of people be like, what? But you don't have bending anymore. How is this possible? What is going on? As I did the first time I watched it. And I sat down, and I thought about it, and I was chewing uh -huh. on it. And it makes perfect sense. Amon somehow figured out a way to block people's bending which is energy bending to my mm -hmm. understanding we have not even heard the term energy bending really other than nothing once in the main series so how did he do it is he just that good of a water bender that he somehow tapped into the energy aspect of it maybe and if he did he obviously doesn't have full control over it so i think that it's just a switch or not it's a on or off it's not an on per element and he's only ever had to flip the switch once per person because it's on or off. But the avatar is the only person with four elements. The airbending switch was already off for Korra. So he's just like, okay, boom. PTSD running through her head. Everything going on. This, this anxiety that she has. And then she sees the boy she loves about to lose something that's so crucial to an individual. And I would imagine that if we had a minute longer in this episode, we would have gotten a montage of all the lessons and everything going and hearing mm -hmm. Tenzin's voice about moving like the leaf and doing all these things. And all of a sudden it just flips on in that switch wasn't affected by Amon's ability mm. because it was already off. So he didn't use his ability to turn it off so it could be turned yep. back on. That's that's where I landed. Yep. Yep, and I agree. Okay. I think that's what it is. Um, did you hear what they talked about in the commentary about that? No. Maybe. Remind me. So I had the same reaction to, wait a second, she just airbended out of nowhere. I What you just said about, like, if we had more time, we would have gotten more of, like, a paced, emotional, impactful, like, coalescence of all the lessons and the things that Cora had learned and it finally just clicked and maybe even like I don't know a sound effect of like when Aang was clearing his chakras and every time a chakra cleared it like had that ding sound it would have been nice if we had like more of like a, an indication of this is happening and clicking finally for her versus just boom air bending out of nowhere but the mechanics of it yes I agree that air bending wasn't on the switch wasn't on for Korra when Amon took her bending away. And interestingly enough, they do support that in the commentary. They do oh. talk about kind of like their their theories around bending and the bending mechanics and how the idea has always been that bending relates to chi growing, flowing through the bender's body. 
And so there's this like life force that's flowing through these pathways. And if you're a waterbender that specializes in healing, you're helping to clear those paths and allow chi to flow more, more smoothly. Um, and so their concept was Amon is using that technique, but for blocking instead of opening. So he is using what is essentially equates to water bending to block people's ability to bend like permanently. Mm. I guess kind of like Aang had his chi blocked in the different chakra points um, and he had to like figure out how to open them. They also made a point about talking about how this is something that they were they think applies to a lot of things in life, how there is a thing and it's neither good nor bad. It's about people's intentions with how they use that thing. And so where a healer would help allow that chi to flow, Amon has used the same technique to do harm. Mm. Um, but yeah, essentially they were saying like at that point, airbending wasn't on. The chi wasn't flowing for airbending. And so Amon didn't sense it. It wasn't there for him to mess with. It's not even, an, now like you were talking and I was thinking about it, I was making connections. Um, I don't even think it's an on or off for the airbending. I think the path just wasn't even made yet to be turned on or off. That's why that's so, oh, I love it. I love it. It's yeah. just like, it doesn't, Makes sense at first, and then you think about it, and then you take the contents of the context of the commentary, and it's just like it's wonderful. Like it's really, yeah. I just wish we had a two part episode uh -huh. to explore it more. That's now all. that we're sitting here talking about it, uh -huh. like I'm getting more and more like emotional and frustrated about it because I just flashed to like the finale of book three from Avatar The Last Airbender, and mm -hmm. we had like the orchestra, and we had the Agni Kai, and we had all of these like slow shots and like pans of like Aang standing in front of like the airships and just the emotional impact was just dialed up so much because they were able to use the time to like weave this tapestry of experience and it's almost like this is a this feels like a storyboard version yeah. of an episode where we have like the key things the key moments but all of the like emotionally supportive uh, style and aesthetics, like that's the part that's missing. And I'm like, I'm I'm on the same page with them. I'm like, give it, yeah. give me another version. Like, let's let's do this again. I, I think and it, make a director's it's cut. Almost fitting though for me that it's not as like grandiose as the end of book three. It it, it just it, feels it like need to be. it wouldn't need to be, but like also it kind of fits into how centralized the story has been to the city mm -hmm. and how grounded it's kind of been versus just like like a giant world war in the, at the end of book three which maybe they build up yeah. to maybe they don't but like think about it in the context of they only knew about this one season and as far as they knew this was done after this it is a bit of a letdown for sure i would agree with that but i think stylistically for me it fits mm -hmm. quite well here and that is a good point the fact that it is more isolated to a city it's not like in the world there's not like multiple um what a, uh, equates to like armies yeah um you know different groups like going up against each other and they did mention that was the case going into the book they said that they were inspired by the first lord of the ring movie where at the end it was like a 1v1 yeah. it wasn't even like a big war scene so they wanted to like kind of pull on that of how it just it's like Korra versus this guy but i think like where the middle ground is is what you mentioned which is like having that little montage and having like these emo these moments that really just like highlight and accentuate what's happening versus it just happening and you kind of have to like process it and pick it apart yourself yeah. Yeah. sitting there with it also i don't know what it was about this background in this hallway but i was like mm -hmm. this is gorgeous like, i feel like they put extra detail in i was staring maybe they just made me look at it for longer like, this is the most <laughs> yeah. beautiful dungy hallway that I've seen in this show yet. Like, where has this been the whole time? Uh, okay, really so. Really making use of their setting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so we got airbending unlocked. Korra is able to attack Amon immediately and gets a few great shots in before Amon bloodbends her. Korra is somehow able to overcome this and launches Amon through a window into the water surrounding the arena. Amon is knocked out for a few moments and we learn that the scarring that was on his face because his mask popped off was actually makeup. There's a little bit of like a, a error here because he didn't have eyebrows when he first took off his mask and then he's <laughs> in the water and he has eyebrows all of a sudden. Because I thought it would be okay. really like committal to shave off his eyebrows <laughs> to wear the makeup. Uh, my headcanon is it just washed off before we saw him. But like it's the only uh -huh. thing I can 
rationalize. Uh, Aman is knocked out for a few moments. Yep. And wakes up instinctively water bends himself out of the waters in front of his devoted followers, including that one annoying guy from the first episode. Mm -hmm. Instead of attacking the avatar, however, Noatok dives back in and runs away. He's lost and he, and he knows it. Noatok makes his way back to Air Temple Island to recover his brother. Unmasked, Noatok tells Tarlock that it's all over and apologizes for everything he has done to him. In so many words, Tarlock tells his brother that fate set them on this path and that he regrets not running away with Noatok all those years ago. Noatok opens the cell for his brother and pleads to run away with him and they can have a second chance together. This was also really emotionally impactful because I'm sure like those are the words Tarlock has been waiting to hear since he was a kid. Yeah. Like again having the chance to actually like run away with his brother and like have the family that he's always wanted and maybe even father. maybe even noah talk too wanted to hear that his brother wanted to go with him yeah i mean to me tarlock was institutionalized by yakon oh yeah there was very heavy morgan freeman at the end of shawshank redemption vibes going on for me with with that flashback from last episode and now they don't have their father to split them apart they don't have ideals it's just two men with a love for each other yep yeah all is quiet in republic city as team avatar regroups on air temple island coming to grips with the events that have unfolded and how the avatar is no longer able to bend all four elements bolin tries to see the silver lining in the situation and notes that at least core's air bending is unlocked but the ill timing on his comment is not well received as boomy's ship arrives at the docks Tenzin tries to comfort Korra by reminding her that she saved the city. This isn't enough for Korra because Amon got away. Off in the distance, Boomy shrieks in excitement and Tenzin sighs. Now he will have to deal with his older brother. This is the only voice acting note I have here. Okay, amazing. We all know that book one was supposed to be the end as far as break now. I know who does the voice of Boomy in book two. I was thinking from a very like realistic standpoint there's no way they got an actor for a shriek off in the distance to do boomy's voice and they didn't this is uh -huh. d bradley baker shrieking as boomy oh my god of course it is and it makes me wish that i, I love the voice actor who actually voices boomy and he does a pretty good job i wish it was d bradley baker with every fiber of my being it would have been so good. It would have been. The other guy is great too. And I'll you'll know who he is when book two coverage comes out. Um, but yeah. I just like I love D. Bradley Baker. I'm super bad batched up right now and like all the clones mm -hmm. from Star Wars. Like it's just I just want more D. Bradley Baker in my life. Can't get enough of the guy. Love him. So talented too. Yeah. It's like whenever they have a need for like a fill in, it's like, let's just call up D. Yeah. D can do it. D can do everything. But by, by the way, for just a friendly reminder to everyone is the voice of Chong is also the voice of Tarlock. Yep. So just, you know, if, if you remember that guess, Greg, we know. Cool. If you didn't just breathe that in for a moment, it's, it shows his <laughs> range. I love it. Somewhere out in the ocean, a small speedboat makes its way towards the horizon. Noah talk looks towards it with a smile on his face and Tarlock sitting still recovering. Noah talk is excited for the future with his brother back. There's nothing they can't do. Tarlock looks down at the collection of equalist gauntlets stored next to him and then reaches for one of the gloves. Noatok continues to steer the ship to its end. Slowly, Tarlock unscrews the cap to the fuel tank and hovers the gauntlet over the tank. It will be just like the good old days. No longer smiling, Noatok sheds a tear, hearing his brother's words. The explosion is loud, but the ripples don't make it to shore. Ugh. I was not prepared for this moment. Mm -mm. I was I, I, I was, was not prepared for this scene. I know this is the part that you. I remembered like, this part, but like I still wasn't. I vividly I, remember. I was I, the, like, how could? I, I mean, I, I say this unjudgingly because you didn't remember it. I'm just realizing my words. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. It's okay. It's like it's just echoes in my brain, and like it's so touching. I'm I'm tearing up a little bit just thinking about it. Yeah. It is. A very fitting end for these two who were so devious in the beginning of the season and so unapologetic for 95% of this season. 
Yeah. And you really learn. I, this is just my takeaway. It's all their father's fault. It really, truly is. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. I don't say that about like everything, but this man ruined these children's lives because of his ambition and his, it's not even ambition. That's too kind of a word. It, it, his uh, hyper fixation on revenge. Yeah. His corruption. Yeah. His corruption. That's yeah. Perfect. Even when they were actively trying to get away from it, they found themselves in the pit of it. And it's just heartbreaking to see. And they only yeah. realize it at the end when, the, you know, they're at the end of their road. They know what's happening. I'm convinced, and this is a common fan theory, but I subscribe to it, that Noah Talk knew that Tarlock was going to do that. Because mm. uh, he was all smiles and sunshine, and then they got to a certain point, and it, it just was like, yeah. I know. And his uh, smile goes away and he lets out a single tear and. Yeah. I subscribe to that fan yeah. theory too. Just like, man, everything you just said, it's so heavy. Yeah. It's, when you think you are acting against the thing that you're running from, the thing that you're trying to ignore, and then you realize you were acting within that the whole time. That is such a, hard realization and then also realizing like i think they they've kind of put it into this these words in the commentary like they both realize like it's just better to like take them out of the picture and yeah. like not hurt the world more not affect it the way that they have been because their father's reach is so fast yeah from beyond the grave from beyond the grave yep. yeah the episode should end it right here if if they didn't have to wrap up the cora thing I'm convinced this would have been it. If this was the end of part one or something. Of yeah. The finale. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I would have liked this to just be the end of part two. Like just end it on here. Mm -hmm. Have everything happen. And then the end of part two is maybe like what we would call now a post credit scene. Right. This. Yeah. That would be yeah. beautiful. It was just. This would work really well as a post credit scene. Yeah. It was beautiful. It was brief. It didn't overstay its welcome. It didn't go too fast for me. Yep. And. That's Yakun's bloodline gone. Yep. Back at the compound at the Southern Water Tribe, uh, Katara. Tri I have not said Katara's name in so long. <laughs> I was like, I must have miswrote that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Katara tries to bring back Korra's bending while her family and friends wait. Unfortunately, Katara is unable to heal the Avatar. She notes that while Korra can still airbend, her connection to the other elements has been severed. Korra enters the room, rejecting Tenzin's comfort and leaves the building. Mako chases after her, but Korra tells him to go back to Republic City and to get on with his life. She isn't the Avatar anymore. You shouldn't stick around for her. She's not special. You only love her because she was the Avatar. And Mako tells her that he doesn't care if she's the Avatar or not, and that he loves her. Korra just can't. I have no patience for the Korra, right? I love Korra. I have no patience for her. I just can't. Yeah, it's, I, it's such a... It's such a teenager type yeah. of thing. And I, I say that like not in a disparaging way. It's just I remember being in moments where I just felt so overwhelmed by my emotions and felt so like down on myself and like almost self-destructive yeah. in a way where like you just you can't help but push people away because you're like, I'm hurting so badly that I just I don't even want I don't even want the comfort. I don't even want the recognition because the way I see myself right now, it does not like connect to the way that you're seeing me so you can like go away yeah let me let me hurt it feels very tropey in how it was handled for me very cw teen drama like and again not a lot of time they can't really like go through it like not everyone can have a zuko at the fire by the uh, by the beach right like you can't mm -hmm. have that time but it just felt so i was watching cw all of a sudden and <laughs> I, I can it, see that. There's just yeah. something in me that just, and I have, I should work on it. It just rejects it and it immediately turns it into a farce in my head. I don't know why. <laughs> don't know why. It just does. Um, Stop watching CW, Greg. I, I haven't watched it in like five years. I've stopped. <laughs> That's how much of an impact it had. <laughs> it is, it's still there. <laughs> so yeah, so she just can't seem to see herself in the way that Mako sees her. So she takes off. Tenzin tells Mako that he needs to be patient 
and that it will take time for Korra to accept what has happened. Korra rides to a cliff overlooking the ocean and walks to the edge. She looks out of the horizon and cries. She sees Tenzin's robes approaching her and tells him that she wants to be left alone. But you called me here, a less familiar voice replies, revealing the air nomad robes to belong to none other than Avatar Aang. Korra, surprised, looks up to see a grown Aang standing there gently smiling at her. He informs her that she has finally connected with her spiritual self. Korra, still shocked at seeing her former incarnation in front of her, asks how she managed to do this. Aang explains that it is when one hits their lowest point that they are open to the greatest change. As this is said, all the past incarnations of the Avatar appear behind Aang, looking towards Korra, letting her know that she is no longer alone, and she has finally moved past her spiritual block. This is the part where it's just like breakneck speed. Like, I, I'm in a roller coaster of <laughs> time and space and spiritual worlds, and I'm like, what is going on? It, how long did it take Aang to do this? Like, a minute. Like, oh my, Literally what is happening? This whole sequence is like three minutes, maybe. Yeah. That's like generous. Yeah. And that's, that's my biggest issue. And again, they had no choice. They mm -hmm. literally only had, what, 12 episodes to tell this story. There, was, there were no other options. With that being said, I can't help but like reflect on Avatar The Last Airbender as a show and just like intuitively feel out the opportunities and like the appearance of Aang, for instance, would have been such a perfect ending to part one of the finale Yeah, where he shows up and is like, you finally did it. Like you finally called me to you and now we can do the work. Yeah. And then part two is about like, them going to find Tenzin and the kids going to find Pema and Beifong and um, like, I don't know, Asami going off and doing something. And then Korra going on a spiritual journey with Aang the way that Aang did with Roku. It's just so perfect. And then through the, that little journey, she has some really um, good like realizations, does some work and then at the end of it is able to restore maybe even like restore her own bending instead of like ang doing it for her well to Does be fair ang is her which i've still not wrapped my head around how that works <laughs> yeah it's, yeah, it's the been spirit is shared three seasons <laughs> dozens of comics and now an additional season still don't uh -huh. understand how that works but they're uh -huh. they're the same they're the avatar so they, she restored her own bending in a weird kind of way i guess yeah yeah technically if you're yeah. being technical about it yes yeah. but just uh yeah i i agree it just felt and they they said this in the commentary they're, they're like we know people think this feels unearned it's like well it is unearned but like also you didn't know you were going to have more seasons so like i would have done the exact same thing i think i just would have been like yeah. wrap it up let's go sorry yeah. let's tie everything in a bow let's yeah. connect all the, the the loose ends and and like call it a day i agree I also appreciate that Bright has that mentality of let's not leave it on a giant cliffhanger like that. And this world that we cared about, it, it really is a, a weird choice to make of leave everyone waiting potentially forever or wrap it up. And they probably knew about like people wanted to hear about the uh, the Zuko's mom story, like Ursa storyline, like, you know, you know, and it's well, let's just it's fine. Yeah. And. I remember reading recently that Nickelodeon talked about the sequels to Avatar The Last Airbender being more of like a season by season type of format. Yeah. Where every season we have a big bad that the Avatar goes up against and then the story resolves and then that's it. Close the book. Next season, completely new, something new. So I think that's also what they were thinking when they were writing this is that potential formatting which i also get Not, nothing is promised i think this the fact that this is only a one season renewal uh really reinforced that with break and this is just what we get and it could have been worse it could have yeah. been so much worse so it could have been it could have been the movie that shall not be named kind of worse <laughs> for sure <laughs> yep 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 so ang gives cora her bending back with a single movement which i I always go back and forth with how unepic that is. Korra's eyes glow white. She enters the Avatar state. She's in this really cool meditative pose. She does all of the bending in a row, and it's all back. Korra exits the Avatar state and turns over to see Mako. She tells him that she loves him too, and they share a loving embrace, and they kiss. 
The group reconvenes at one of the Southern Water Tribe temples. Lynn walks up to Korra and kneels before her. Korra enters the Avatar state, restores Lynn's bending. Lynn raises rocks. Everyone cheers. Yay, good time. Awesome. Everyone's proud of Korra, including Tenzin, who tells her the end. He calls her Avatar Korra. Avatar. Oh, that's right. <laughs> blink and you miss it. <laughs> yeah. Let it, uh, half of a blink and you'll miss something. The other half of your blink, you'll miss something else. Yes. It's very touching. It <sighs> means so much that Tenzin called her Avatar Korra, considering the previous Avatar was his father, which must be mind-bending for him. Huh? <laughs> mind-bending. 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 <laughs> With all that being said, Acorn, who's your MVP for the episode? I have whiplash. I have to like I process know. for a moment. <laughs> Me as well. That was a lot. Uh -huh. um, good Lord. I think, I feel like it has to be Korra. Yeah. But I don't really feel good about that. I don't either. It feels unearned, doesn't it? It feels unearned, <laughs> but I think it needs to be Korra. It needs to be Korra. I would agree. I really want to give it to Tarlock. I thought about Tarlock too. As well. Yep. That he's my runner up. My like officially it's Korra. The the narrative is around Korra. Korra is the MVP. Yeah. Um, but the sacrifice that Tarlock made, I mean, he didn't just end the rule of an earth shattering villain. He gave up the future with his brother because it had to be done. He knew he that. It was a great sacrifice. It was a great sacrifice. He knew that Noah Talk wasn't going to end here. Mm -hmm. That he was, it was just a matter of time before he pops back up with another plan of some kind. So it mm -hmm. had to end. And it was just really touching. Yeah. It, it feels like Zuko's arc to a much lesser degree in terms of memorability for me. Yeah, I agree. And I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but in the commentary, Steve mentioned that when he finally did learn Amon's backstory, because going into the role, he did not know anything about like mm -hmm. Noah talk and uh, ev everything. When he found out, he was really deeply affected by it to the point where he said, this has never happened in a cartoon role for me. I've never been like emotionally touched by a character's backstory. Yeah. And he and Dee apparently had to like console each other with the news because they found out <laughs> oh, at the no. same time and they were like, oh, this is heavy. <laughs> so like your point about it being like maybe not as impactful as Zuko's story, but still impactful. Like it does ring true. Yeah. It, it had, it, there's a lot to it. Yeah. What is your moral of the episode? I'm going to go a little meta with this. Okay. I'm stepping out of the show. Okay. I'm not talking about the moral in the show, but I'm mm -hmm. talking about the moral about the show. And I think it's that it's okay to create something that is not perfect. Oh. Because that is a lesson that I need to internalize. Um, because I am a recovering perfectionist. And I think if I was in Mike and Brian's shoes, reflecting about the show, I wouldn't be getting wrapped up in the opportunities of like setting and like environment and everything that they were talking about, I would be having the same moment talking about, Oh, I could have like told this story better or if only, or I could, you know, yeah. could have done this, could have done that. Um, but it's okay because like Brian said, you can be really critical as a creator, but the thing you created still has touched lives. It still has made an impact and the impact is what is the most important part. Yeah. For sure. I really like that. And I actually struggle because of how fast this episode was and how many things were going on to mm -hmm. find a cohesive moral. I guess uh, nothing lasts forever. Mm. Permanence is an illusion, something like that, maybe. I like that because yeah. that can work on a couple different levels, both with like, if you're rock bottom, that's not going to last. Yeah. yeah. If you are in a good position that's not going to last but in both of those scenarios like learn what you can from being in that moment yeah because permanence is an illusion with all it being said everyone thank you all so much for hanging out with us tonight we super appreciate it uh we are gonna go as far as a podcast is concerned again we're doing our post season little break However, we are going to be doing some recordings for the YouTube page. So make sure you're going to youtube.com slash after the podcast. Uh, we are finally going to be watching the live action Netflix avatar, The Last Airbender. I don't know how it's going to go. I've been hearing I'm mixed I'm things. <laughs> We're both horribly afraid, uh. just bracing ourselves for the worst, hoping for the best. Yes. And uh, until then... And those episodes are released. You can find 
me over twitch.tv slash booster greg on monday thursday monday not thursday I'm never on thursday why did i say thursday monday monday friday <laughs> don't worry about wednesdays 8 p.m eastern standard time come hang out we have a good time we chat up for a bit then we play a game yeah you can also find me on twitch uh monday wednesday friday at 3 p.m eastern where you can find me playing minecraft um i have too many projects going right now so that's fun <laughs> but the overarching project is still building mushroom kingdom from the mario movie in a minecraft survival world so that is a good time um also i just want to say that we for those of you who have been listening live as these episodes have been coming out thank you for your patience mm -hmm. i know we haven't been as consistent as we have been in the past um but like we've mentioned before you know greg and i are doing this as like a hobby passion project on the side of our lives and so um this season this book things got a little little rough uh scheduling wise so we just appreciate you hanging in there and being patient and everything we sometimes get reminders of people coming in and being like i'm listening to the podcast all over again while i wait for the new episodes mm -hmm. and it's like that's amazing mm -hmm. but also like sorry we're waiting yeah. sorry we, get, we have it coming I um so we're really looking forward to going into book two with you all yes and let you know a little bit behind the scenes as well i think what we're going to do now is it might take longer for a season to get released but it will stay consistent yeah. It's is going to be we're going to I think this one we chose um speed of release versus consistency and that's not going to happen again. That no one we didn't even like that plan as it mm -hmm. was going out. So um that's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So if it's a little late for season 2, no one likes season 2 anyways. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we're not we're not rushing to get anywhere. No, it's fine. It's we'll fine. Get it when we get It'll there. be fine. We have a plan. It'll be great. It'll be awesome. Everyone, thank you all so much and we'll see you next time on Avatar, Avatar the, the podcast. podcast. Avatar the Podcast is a proud part of the Geek Generation Network. Remember to check out all of our podcasts at thegeekgeneration.com. Thank you.